This collection is in Bury St Edmunds and the curator is Lord Middleton. Well, from the early church clocks, the clocks quickly became much more elaborate and more lavishly mm -hmm. decorated. When did the first portable mechanical watches or clocks? Well, around about the year 1450, mm. by Peter Henlein. This is an example of one. You can see it's a fairly sizable machine. Not exactly portable, you have to have a fairly tough pocket to put it in. You obviously couldn't fit uh, pendulums and a weight in a thing like that, though, could you? Uh, no, you couldn't. No, no that, 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 that would be ridiculous. Um, no, these were spring-driven. This one here, for example, is a spring-driven clock. There is a false pendulum on it. We set it ticking. In fact, it's, it, it's not really a pendulum, it's just a balance. But the other thing about it is it's amazingly thick they are. The spring is inside the barrel mm. here. And uh, they work reasonably well, but... Again, I, I, you'd have to check it every so often with the sundial. That's the frequency of sundials in every church, I'm certain, because of uh, you know, people needing to alter their watches. Is, is the jewelled one, would that be a, a lady's watch? Or, uh... No, I think it's big enough for a gentleman's watch. I mean, ladies did wear watches like this. They used to wear them on a long chain around the neck. Watches like this were obviously very expensive and could only be bought by very rich people. The first really cheap mass-produced clocks and watches started being made in America in the 1840s. The one over here, which I like particularly because um, it's rather splendid, it has a railway timekeeper written all over it. Uh, it's a sure sign of really poor quality. Um, I don't know how American railways were run, but they, well, they run on time. But if they were run on, according to watches like this, they would never have gone anywhere. Not only could ordinary people start to afford a watch, with the coming of factories and railways, they actually needed one. Always leave plenty of time to catch a train, but... However, watches were still oh, set no. by sundials, so the time was slightly different in every town. OK, my man, I know my watch is right, so where's the train gone? The train left on time, sir. Oh, no, 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 I should have five minutes at least. What's happening? Well, your watch is on local time, you see. And we were on railway time here. Train left when it should have done. The idea of wristwatch is surprisingly recent. They first became popular among artillery officers during the First World War. It was a considerable technical feat to miniaturise all the parts to this extent. Mechanical wristwatches are among the most sophisticated mechanisms ever made and have always been regarded as treasured possessions. Oh, just wait till the gang sees this. Hey, kids, come on, I'm running. Oh, it's just perfectly perfect. And so are you, both of you, Mom and Dad. Well, Sally, you're our big girl now. And Mother and I wanted our present to tell you just how proud we are of you. Today it may seem obvious that electronics provides a simpler way to miniaturise the watch. But it wasn't until the 60s that all the parts became small enough to make the idea practical. This is the first electric watch introduced by the Hamilton Watch Company in America in 1956. Inside, it doesn't really look very different from an ordinary mechanical watch. There's a little balance wheel, but there's a tiny electromagnet on it which keeps it moving backwards and forwards. The really remarkable thing was making a battery this small, though most of the development work on this was done by the military, mainly for use by spies and their radios. The next electric watch to appear was far more rev revolutionary. This is the Bulliver Accutron. It's got two tiny electromagnets you can see here. At the third stroke, it will be 4, 37 and 50 seconds. The Bulliver Accutron uses a new electronic timekeeping principle, a tuning fork. Listen. A tuning fork to give you accuracy to within a minute a month guaranteed. Never bet against a Bulliver Accutron, the most accurate watch you can buy. You can see this easier on this uh, Bulliver clock. Um, if I pop a battery in, I think you'll be able to see the tuning fork here start to vibrate. This really is an exact mechanical equivalent of the quartz watch. The idea of using quartz was nothing new. 
The first quartz clock had been developed as early as 1929 in the prolific Bell Labs that also invented the transistor in the 40s. But these quartz clocks, like this German one, use much larger bits of quartz, that's the quartz crystal down the bottom, and rather bulky electronics. This is the uh, first true quartz watch, introduced in 1967 by the Japanese firm Seiko. The Americans then regained the lead and uh, the Hamilton Watch Company then introduced the Pulsar. This is the first solid state watch with no moving parts. These are rotary watches. This one has a traditional Swiss movement and a very handsome face. This is a rotary quartz watch, devastatingly accurate. This is a quartz watch too, but it's like a little computer. You press this little button and look, first the time, then the day and date, and then the seconds. Very clever. It'll look smashing on your wrist. Rotary, every time. The bright red displays on the first digital watches used so much power that they could only be switched on occasionally when you actually needed to know the time. The first watch to um, have a liquid crystal display was uh, this one. This uses so little power that the display could be left running. This uh, doesn't work anymore. The early liquid crystals were rather unstable. Today this problem's been solved and liquid crystals have been made to do some quite remarkable things. Whole windows like this are being developed. This is a bottle of liquid crystal. It's actually a liquid. And the watch display is made by sandwiching it between two bits of glass. Um, I've clipped them in here and uh, put a drop of liquid on top. It'll slowly sleep, it seep into the gap. Oops. Wop, wop up the surplus. Um, now, these two bits of glass are coated with a square of a transparently thin metallic layer that can conduct electricity. So if I now, um, whoops, connect it up, uh, one on the top here, and uh, one on the side. It doesn't appear to do. It doesn't appear to do anything at all. What we need to make a complete display is um, a pair of Polaroid sunglasses. If I hold one lens behind the other and rotate it, you can see it goes from light to dark. Well, if I now um, put the uh, sunglasses in the clip as well, one lens in front of the sandwich. Um, and uh, one lens behind, like that. And now I connect it up again, you should be able to see the electricity has the effect of polarizing the liquid crystal material. I can show you just how little electricity this uh, needs to make it work. If I hold on to one wire, simply touch, touching the cell with my other hand is enough to make it work, although it's, the electricity has got pass through the resistance of my body. To make the complete watch display, the metallic film is simply split up into segments, each of which can be separately connected. This liquid crystal display is all still connected up, but of course it's completely invisible until the Polaroids are in place. And a real watch display also needs a bit of aluminium behind to reflect the light. The chip in a quartz watch is equally ingenious. Here we've made up part of the circuit in separate stages. The first one keeps the crystal vibrating.